By late 1968, the army had restored order in most of China. Mao Zedong announced the victory of the Cultural Revolution. He directed administrators and intellectuals to be temporarily relocated to labor camps to help them better understand Mao's values and appreciate the needs of peasants by experiencing their living conditions. With the same rationale, Mao also greatly expanded a program of permanently relocating urban students to rural communes or farms administered by the army. It has been argued that this relocation of educated youth was intended to cool off the overheated struggle of the Cultural Revolution, to reduce a surplus of labor in the cities, or to ensure that a privileged urban-based social class could not remain. Millions of students who had graduated from middle schools, as well as students who attended high schools and universities, volunteered out of loyalty to Maoist ideals or to escape their lot in the cities. Millions more were coerced. In all, some 17 million young people were relocated up to the mountains and down to the countryside. In addition to performing required manual labor, some of these sent down students took on the role of part-time medics, known as barefoot doctors. Something that left a deep impression was going to Shangxi to join a production team. We came across poor peasants struggling between life and death. This issue formed a new challenge to our thinking. to our thoughts about life. At this point, I became a barefoot doctor. My first surgery was a case of postpartum mastitis. The whole breast was swollen and long. The patient couldn't sleep at all. Actually, there was a huge sack of pus inside incredibly swollen and painful. All we could do was take a pen knife, actually an old type of razor, and cut into the abscess, catching the blood and pus in a bowl. Then we put the bowl on the ground, and dogs came along to lap it up. The wife of the party branch secretary had a gastric perforation. Acidic material from her stomach and internal organs poured into her abdomen. It was a serious illness. We only had one kind of anesthetic at the time, spinal anesthetic, which you gave as an injection in the spinal cord but it wasn't strong enough. There was still some pain, especially after time had passed. Her intestines pushed out and couldn't be pressed back in. By the time we'd stitched up her stomach and washed her abdominal cavity, the anesthetic had already worn off. At this point, we were holding on to her intestines. We couldn't get them to go back in. She was awake. So we said to her, you must help us. Take a deep breath and we'll push. When it hurts, take a deep breath and we'll push. I grabbed a piece of wood and little by little we pushed the intestines back and stitched her up. We worked together to complete the surgery. In the end, she fully recovered. During this time, we gradually came to stand on common ground with the local people. We had a shared fate. That is, a feeling of fighting together from this sick and impoverished starting point. From this shared fate, we had some knowledge. 
We communicated with some people in Beijing and were able to get medicine to treat the local people. The number of patients far surpassed our expectations. Educated youth also served widely as teachers in rural elementary and middle schools, greatly expanding rural education programs. In the later stage of the Cultural Revolution, educated youth going down to the countryside gave local educational enterprise a lot of help. Since when they came down, we had already started to resume class and make revolution. It was around 1967, 1968 when we started to resume class and make revolution. Early in the Cultural Revolution, we had suspended class to make revolution. After we started resuming class and making revolution, generally it was educated youth who came to be our teachers. The quality of their education was much higher than that of us local people. But we benefited a lot from them. They had a great positive influence on our culture and thinking, every aspect. I was sent to a village in the Mount Yiming area. My father was identified as an active counter-revolutionary, but the village's poor and lower middle peasants chose me to be the first teacher in the village junior high school. I worked for two years. I joined a Mao Zedong thought propaganda team and performed the model drama Red Lantern, which the educated youth and members of the community had practiced together. At that time, people carried their cotton blankets and padded cotton clothes and came late at night to watch with rapt attention. We also went to other villages to increase communication. The Cultural Revolution caused local people in rural villages to begin caring about politics to know about the political voice of Beijing and the nation's leadership, to care about the nation's change of affairs. Often, educated youth who had volunteered to go to the countryside out of idealism were forced to scale back their goals when the reality of rural China differed from what they'd imagined. How can I explain it? In fact, at the time, we did not understand what it was to be used politically. We just went because of a very simple idea. A few of us classmates who had grown up together happened to hear that peasants in northern Shaanxi had nothing but rice husks to eat. We broke down crying. We could not stand that farmers were eating husks while we ate rice and flour. We wanted to be with them to improve such terrible conditions. Out of enthusiasm, we went. It was that simple. What were peasants like? What was life like at the lowest level of Chinese society? I understood some things I had previously never thought about. For example, in the beginning, we thought, okay, we've studied some books, we'll go to the countryside to help the peasants, and together we'll fight heaven and earth. Work against backwardness, we were full of zeal like this. But after a few years in the countryside, we found that China was not as simple as we'd imagined. It was not like, as long as you work hard and endure hardship, you will prosper. We saw it was more complex. What were the peasants' lives like? In the first year, we went to work every day. Work points. You young people don't understand this. I earned the highest work points among the women. After a year of hard work, I still had not earned enough for my food ration. I was 37 RMB in debt for the next year. That's how difficult it was. Even working diligently to get the most points, I could not earn enough for my food ration. My family had to make up the difference of 37 RMB. Relations between the urban educated youth and local peasants and cadres were sometimes strained. Many cases of rape and assault on educated youth were recorded. But some educated youth also created tensions. We stayed in the home of a son of rich peasants. His parents had died long before, and he was all alone. He was a strong worker for the production team. So the production team never treated him as the son of a rich peasant. Still, no matter what, he had that shadow, you know. One time, we were using waste from the girls' outhouse to fertilize our garden. But there wasn't enough. The boys were lazy. So they had been using our host's toilet to save a few steps. Our landlord was named Shagu, a real country name meaning ox in the sand. I said, go to Shagu's outhouse and get some waste for the garden. My teammates said, is it really okay? They were concerned, since manure was like gold in the village. I said, why not? You three used his toilet, so why can't we get half back? 
so they went and got half of the waste to fertilize our garden. When it got dark, we finished up to go home. Just then, a good friend of mine, a country boy, ran over. He said, you'd better not go back. Shagu is standing at the entrance to the village, ready to fight you. Shagu knew I was the one who'd instigated it. I said, what do I have to fear? Three boys used his toilet, but we only took half of the waste. He got off easy. Then I just swaggered back. When I got to the village entrance, Chagu was indeed standing there with a dark face, the kind of expression that made you feel a real storm was coming. Then I saw our production brigade secretary. He was standing there, watching at a distance. He knew something big was going to happen. He was afraid of something bad happening to the educated youth sent by Chairman Ma. I figured, Shagu is a rich peasant, and the secretary is watching. Shagu won't dare do anything to me. So I passed him as if nothing had happened. That was that. But later on, it was obvious Shagu was really, really angry. Even before that, he had never liked me much because I treated him with total disregard, because I didn't treat him like a person. So you could say that people signed up voluntarily at the time, but under the circumstances, voluntary actually meant by force. When we got to the train station, everyone was crying. Tears welled up in my eyes too, but I didn't cry. I thought I couldn't cry because I was older than they were. The younger ones were crying hysterically, some holding their parents, crying, I'm not going. It was a scene of great sadness. People were all crying. But I didn't cry because I was the leader of the company. I took 186 people from my school with me. And the military representative accompanied us. After I was promoted to be the political leader, I still kept working in the field. Generally speaking, as a leader, I didn't have to work anymore. I could just supervise other workers and discuss things if a problem arose. But I still worked. I was determined to continue working. However much others worked, I worked too. Sometimes I worked even more than they did. I told them that leaders should stand in the bitterest place, and the dirtiest place, the most tiring place. If I stood there, then everyone else's spirit would be lifted. If I had stood in the best place, everyone would just point and say, just look at our leader. So back then, we would say in the morning when we went to work, we followed the leader's footsteps. So I'd be at the front. After work, the leader had to walk in the other's footsteps. That meant that all others went home first. You had to be the last. I joined the army in Tianjin. At that time, joining the army was the best choice. It was a hundred times better than going up to the mountains and down to the countryside, going to a rural village to join a production team, or going to the production and construction corps. As soon as you became a soldier, your social status was high. Also, during the Cultural Revolution, I was supposed to go down to the countryside. I was totally unwilling to leave Beijing. Some people said, you can study the accordion, so I started studying at home. At that time in Beijing, studying musical instruments at home was called having a specialized skill, right? Right, having a specialized skill. Later on, one of the neighbors in our courtyard mentioned that Beijing Children's Palace was enrolling students. They had a training class. I studied on my own and took my accordion with me to take the admissions test and passed. After that, I'd go to the teacher's house to study. But the teacher said to me, why are you studying accordion? I said I didn't want to go up to the mountains and down to the countryside. Ha, huh, so honest. I was the oldest in my family, and my younger brother's health was not good. I'd certainly be the one going down, but I did not want to go at all. I thought maybe I could join an art troupe or something like that. The teacher said, you probably won't be able to get what you want just by playing the accordion. In an art troupe, the one who plays the accordion can usually also play the piano. 
she told me, if you can only play the accordion, that's not enough. However, you're already too old to start learning piano. Yeah, a nightmare. Later, the teacher said, open your mouth and let me look at your teeth. She said, not bad. You can study the flute. I promise that you can study with the best flute teacher at the Central Conservatory of Music. Because my teacher taught piano at the Central Conservatory of Music. She said, if you study flute, you'll definitely pass the test since they lack people in flute, especially girls. So, I went back and told my parents I was going to study flute. So, the original motivation for you studying an instrument was that you didn't want to go up to the mountains and down to the countryside. Right, that's exactly what it was. My hometown is Beijing. From 1968 to 1975, I was on the grasslands of Inner Mongolia. In 1975, I came back to Beijing. In the end, I came back to Beijing. I feel fortunate that during this fanatical, chaotic era, I chose to go down to the countryside in Inner Mongolia and join a production team on the grasslands. There were some students who had already gone up to the mountains and down to the countryside. When they came back, they campaigned for us to go. Of course, they were really enthusiastic. You could go to the village, fight heaven and earth, change the appearance of the village, etc. We knew sooner or later we'd have to go up to the mountains and down to the countryside. So the question was, where would we go? I think the older educated youth who had gone before us really had the power to incite us. I was really worked up by them. I figured, since I had to go anyway, why not go to the grasslands? The grassland was a completely unfamiliar environment. First of all, you were entering a nomadic society. At that time, the whole prairie was nomadic. People and their herds moved year-round to wherever grass and water were available. All four seasons, we were constantly on the move. Also, the natural environment was harsh. It got to 30 below zero in winter. It was bitterly cold. Summer was not actually that hot, but the sun was scorching. So, the climate was really different. And then, you had to learn how to be nomadic. You had to learn how to ride a horse. To speak with the villagers, you had to learn Mongolian. You couldn't use Chinese to communicate. You had to learn all parts of the nomadic lifestyle. Also, I could feel something that came from a different ethnic group the Mongolian people's exceptionally generous love. They accepted us like family, you wouldn't believe it. They were really tolerant of those of us who'd come from outside, who spoke a different language, who were of a different ethnicity. The nomads offered us a lot of love. I could really feel this. So I felt I should use this type of love to repay society repay other people. On May 5, 1972, 69 young men and women burned to death fighting a brush fire in Inner Mongolia. It was perhaps the largest of numerous such calamities to befall sent down youth in every region such as the wildfires that claimed so many lives in Heilongjiang province along the border with the Soviet Union, which was then locked in an armed dispute with China regarding this border. At the time, the way we were educated, every young person wanted to be a revolutionary. Their combativeness was really strong. When you get to that stage, when you're so combative, of course you neglect your life. You can't revere life or cherish your body. So at that time, in that place we were at, there were many, many accidents, weren't there? I didn't place importance on life. It was my place to die. To die for revolution was glorious. Think of our troop, just speaking of educated youth. There were some who had their legs crushed while working, who died, who drowned while swimming, all kinds of things. I remember it like it was yesterday. Just after we went there, our 43rd Regiment, that is our 4th Division, 
In 1970, there were three huge fires. The 39th Regiment, the 36th Regiment or 37th Regiment, and our 43rd Regiment all had many examples of heroics during these fires. Sun Lianhua was representative of the many martyrs from our regiment, then the 39th Regiment. They were all Pudan District Ganquan Middle School students. Dozens died. Between the three fires, about 100 people died. That was an awful thing. At the time, though, it was no big deal. Some educated youth didn't even know about it. We only know there was this glorious martyr, Sun Lian Hua. There was obviously no need to stop this fire. Why bother? We were far from Russia. It couldn't burn across Lake Kanka. In that place, there was no dry land connecting. It was all grassland. It wouldn't burn. In April 1970, scientists, engineers, and technicians allowed to work undisturbed on China's outer space program launched their first satellite. In 1971, universities began to reopen. By 1973, they began admitting students who had completed middle school and more than two years of labor as workers, peasants, or soldiers, based on the recommendations made by party committee members who had overseen their work. If you went to college, you were a worker, peasant, soldier, student. We local people thought going to college was something only for the educated youths. We didn't even dream about attending college. It was true that it was mostly educated youth selected as worker, peasant, soldier students. But some local people also borrowed the glory and were recommended for university. I was a worker, peasant, soldier student. I followed the educated youths and went to college in 1975. It was July then, just the time when they harvest wheat in the Northeast. Can you imagine what it was like to harvest the wheat? They didn't use harvesters. Maybe there weren't that many of them. So they hustled these young, educated youth to the wheat fields and gave each one a sickle. Then one of the older staff members told you how to cut it down, and you went to work cutting it down. When we finished cutting, the ground was covered with wheat, and it got soaking wet. But no one paid any attention to how you cut. It was just to get you into the wheat fields. Can you imagine what that was like? when they were soaked with water above your knees, that was called scooping out the wheat. Scooping out wheat in the water, it rained every day, so it was soaked every day. Spending every day in the water, that's the first thing. The second thing that got to you were the sand flies midges. Flies in the Northeast are like mosquitoes, only smaller, usually only a tenth the size of mosquitoes. They bore into hair to bite you and you couldn't grab them. People's faces would swell up. It was even worse for people who had allergies. We all just looked at each other. And there was nothing you could do, right? The educated youth from Beijing and Tianjin had it the worst, because nobody was prepared for this. The only way I could get out of the countryside was to find a way to go to university, since that was the year when there was first some hope of going to a university. Whenever it was that Chairman Mao said, the universities should be reopened. From the time they started having worker peasant soldier students, there was this historic opportunity to be a worker peasant soldier student. I thought all education was a distant dream that was far out of reach. I just wanted to go to university. And then I had a goal. The goal was to create the conditions that would let me go to university and get myself out of the countryside. So, I became an educated youth with a goal. Instead of a monotonous, empty life, I had a goal. I put everything I had into that goal. First, I had to devote myself to winning everyone's approval. I thought to myself, you're so puny. You don't even weigh 90 pounds. You can't carry anything heavy. So if you want people to approve of you, you have to become a really capable person. No one could catch me resting. I wouldn't let anyone see me rest. I did everything from start to finish, for sure. Like a beast of burden. I put everything I had into work, because every year there was a selection. 
selecting a five goods fighter or something, an outstanding youth league member. We couldn't enter the Communist Youth League because our family background was no good. So with that goal, every day I hoped the Youth League branch secretary would talk to me, since if the branch secretary wanted to talk with me, it was preparation to recommend me for the Youth League. I'd already drafted my application many times. I watched the model ballet, Red Detachment of Women. I couldn't sleep that night after listening to the music. I felt I had to struggle to get into the youth league and get into the party, get close to the political organizations. That was what was on my mind every day, how to turn myself into someone people would think was capable. So then I performed my work especially well. You were concerned so much with other people's approval. Yes, since that was the only way, because they were always making selections in the Democratic Life meetings. Every few days they would hold Democratic Life meetings, I remember. Everyone would offer opinions at the meetings. So and so, I have a criticism of you. You don't do such and such well. If you didn't join in and speak up, that was unacceptable. Expressing your opinion was required. So, at those times I wanted people to be able to praise me or commend me. It was something I would die for. That's how I thought that then. Many educated youth were overwhelmed by the strain of living in an unfamiliar rural environment, far away from family members at a volatile time. Some attempted to flee the countryside. I went to Lujongba in Baoshan, Yanan province. I missed home a lot after I got there. We could not go back. People had to obtain an authorization to go back home. However, there was really no way to get such an authorization. At that time, my mom was also imprisoned. I missed home very much. Only my 80-year-old maternal grandma and my younger teenage brother were left at home. A classmate and I arranged to climb over the Jeligong Mountains to reach Bay Ocean. I was just 19 years old, and I have no idea where I got the courage. With the help of a peasant, the two of us boated across the Lu River. We carried backpacks and climbed the Jeligong Mountains. We had no solid food to carry with us, so we stir-fried some sun-dried corn and put it in our bags. We ate a little corn when we were hungry and drank from a mountain spring. We climbed for two days, staying overnight at peasants' homes. When we woke up the second morning, we had the idea to trace the horses' paths. The horses passed through carrying luggage, so we would not lose our way. After three days, we got over the Jeligong Mountains and arrived at Bay Ocean. The next morning after we woke up, we went to the Bay Ocean bus terminal. We found a truck transporting goods to Kunming. We probably offered some money and then sat on the top of the truck. We went home and I met my mom who was locked in her work unit and unable to go home. Today everything's different. This was once a border checkpoint, now it's a scenic overlook. How can I describe it? Back then this was a hostile border, now it's peaceful. Back then, you came from over there to here. As soon as I got here, I saw they were checking vehicles, inspecting vehicles and people. And just then, I knew I was stuck. So from here, I went into the lake from over there. From here, the lake trickles along, so I was both swimming and wading. I got over there, skirted the inspection station, went over there and just walked off. It was pouring rain and the ground was soaked. At the time, what made you want to run away? What made you feel you had to do this? I just wanted to go home. In the 10 years I've been here, I'd only been home once. The place we were sent to was extremely poor. You do manual labor for a year without earning any work points. I worked my fingers to the bone for a full year had the best work performance, put in the most time, and it only counted for a few pounds of grain. Just when this grain had been passed out, my parents got in touch with me, 
saying they were being sent to a village. Since during the Cultural Revolution and some previous movements, my father was struggled against, even imprisoned. During the Cultural Revolution, he was continually struggled against. His body was already halfway handicapped. He basically had no more strength to work. My brother was still young, only 13, so he had no working strength either. My old grandma was too weak to work. Three of them were sent to the village, live or die. It wasn't like the educated youth who got a moving allowance. They had nothing. Live or die, up to you. No matter what, you were being sent to the village. Then it was up to me to save them, since I was able to work. I wasn't living with them. It was hard for the three of them to make their way. I'd just been allotted a few hundred pounds of grain, grain from the frontier. At the time, educated youth were allowed to transfer from village to village, from a frontier village to the interior. There was this policy. So I applied for a transfer to be with my father and take care of them. So I helped my father and them settle down and gave them my grain, which they depended on during the most difficult time. From the village, I went on my own to Myanmar. I ended up staying in Myanmar for 15 years through the brutal revolution there. I joined Myanmar's Communist Party, became a cadre and an official, and lived to come back and tell the tale. In 1977, universities resumed admitting students based on nationwide examinations. The policy of sending urban students to the countryside ended in 1980. The Barefoot Doctor program was phased out later that same decade. After a period of time, our school's deputy secretary leadership came and told me, you can go and do technical work. I went to the Agricultural Bureau to work on technology for cultivating fruit trees. Altogether, this was better than being an educated youth on a farm. This was during the Cultural Revolution. After the Cultural Revolution, I went to university in the class that entered in 78. My father was not rehabilitated until 1982. My feeling was that our environment was a bit better compared to others. I played a lot. There was a lake by our house. In the summer, we could fish, catch dragonflies, catch cicadas, or fight crickets. We could just play as we liked. So my feeling is that at that time, kids were the luckiest. A lot of people say the Cultural Revolution was actually a cultural desert. I feel it wasn't like that at all. When the Cultural Revolution started, I was in first grade. For me, the Cultural Revolution was a culturally abundant era. For example, many model operas and other artistic forms emerged at this time. Ballet was received from the West with its dance and music. There were opportunities to join in artistic activities. Having a chance to appreciate artistic activities. Another thing is that during the Cultural Revolution, we read a lot of Marx and Lenin, as well as Chairman Mao's three constantly read articles. This also wasn't complete brainwashing. From them, we gained a lot of knowledge of classic literature. So reading Marxist books, reading Mao Zedong's books, really gave us spiritual resources and a kind of power to think through issues, rather than to abide by so-called doctrines. 
Our class was split into several factions, those who beat, those who were beaten, those who exposed, and those who struggled against others. If you beat someone, you might have forgotten about it, but the one who was beaten wouldn't forget it for years. You insulted them, humiliated them, divided. Even now, it's truly difficult for everyone to get together for a reunion. This is our situation. Down to today, 80 to 90 percent of my classmates are poverty-stricken. Because after we returned from the countryside, most of the educated youth were assigned to factories and have earned very little. So I think that for individuals, this has had a great impact on their lives. As for the nation, I think the Cultural Revolution was a mutual massacre among its people. So it destroyed people's kindest elements and brought out the ugliest tendencies from their hearts. So I think, up until today, in the whole country, the most basic sense of morality and faith were lost. And that has persisted up until today. Everyone was alienated, just like enemies. Later, in 1977 and 1978, people in our class were able to take the college entrance exam again. Probably no more than five people passed the exam. There were almost 60 students in our class. Most people stopped studying after the Cultural Revolution and became workers. Some worked in little industries on the street, just whatever they could do. Now, a few have a very low pension and they are in poor health too. It's really sad. This generation was totally ruined. However, some people are strange. There's a classmate who still really misses those days. He was beaten back then. But later, he optimistically joined the party and became a cotter. He thinks it's pretty good. His father was executed by firing squad. Once I met up with him, I said, you are in the party now? He said, yes. He became union chairman in a little local factory. He was enjoying himself. What I think is, his monthly pension is really low. So, people's opinions vary now. For the whole nation, the worst injury was that no person can say he or she wasn't a persecutor during the Cultural Revolution. Turning every innocent person into a guilty one, this is the very worst aspect of the Cultural Revolution. Take myself as an example. I was only 11 years old when I joined in the Cultural Revolution. But because I was good at writing, I was called upon to write all of the big denunciations, even up until the first few years after the Cultural Revolution. After my worker-peasant-soldier student period, I returned to my original workplace, a research institute. They wanted to attack someone. What's funny is, I can't even remember who the victim was. But our deputy director asked me to write a denunciation although the Cultural Revolution was over already. Anyway, since they asked me to write, I wrote. During the Cultural Revolution, because I could write passably well, I denounced more than 10 people, at least people who had nothing to do with me. I didn't even know some of them. So it is very difficult to say who really did nothing bad. I felt I ought to own up to it. If nobody in our generation stands up to say I did some bad things or the Cultural Revolution was evil, then ours will be a failed generation. Now there are big conflicts between the leftist and rightist ideas. The conflicts mostly focus on how the Cultural Revolution should be judged, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. Some time ago there were some people who wanted me to express my opinion. There was a good friend who wrote an article and asked me what I thought. Of course, this was a good friend. Later I wrote something about it. I said, right now our country faces all kinds of issues such as environmental pollution and corruption. If we emphasize the question of the Cultural Revolution or other problems from our past with you on your side, me on mine, fighting over it, this is not a good thing. This generation of people walked the same path. Each person carried a belly full of perplexity. Some became laid-off workers. Those who came out independently rushed into their own fields step by step. Today's path still must be chosen. 
it has not yet been settled. So, this was the generation of the Cultural Revolution. All along, I believed if my generation would rise up, it would bring with it a powerful China. This generation, from age 10, began class struggle, mutual deception. Two sides unable to coexist made their way through a bloody path of carnage. I think the study of the Cultural Revolution is very necessary. There are a lot of debates on the Internet. Most people comment negatively about it, while quite a few are positive. The difference is related to personal experiences. For example, people who rebelled, seized power, grabbed houses, and benefited from the Cultural Revolution would feel positively about the event. I agree that the Cultural Revolution was basically not good. However, since it did reign in some lawless senior cotters of the time, I'm afraid the Cultural Revolution also had a positive impact. I think China has the soil for the Cultural Revolution to happen again. The Cultural Revolution didn't come out of nowhere. It had a base in the masses in cultural traditions. Take another country. It could not happen in America. It could not occur no matter how great the leader is. China's science, technology and material life have advanced greatly in the past decades. However, I don't feel national culture, customs and habits have changed. If a situation comes to a head, for example, a civil turbulence breaks out, I think some local rebellions might possibly overthrow local tyrants and redistribute land because of their jealousy. This is not to say the distribution system in China is totally reasonable right now. There are problems that must be addressed, but the foundation for another cultural revolution still exists. If our generation refused to talk about the cultural revolution, it would be terrible. Filmed interviews are particularly interesting because you can see body language and you can hear the patterns and rhythms of speech delivery, all of which I would argue convey meaning. Now, we may not be particularly good at decoding that meaning, but we should be thinking about it more seriously. No sources are perfect. I can't think of any sources that are perfect, but they supplement other sources and add intimate details that complicate standard narratives and force us to avoid sweeping generalizations that try to explain the whole of China. There wasn't one cultural revolution pattern. There were hundreds and hundreds of cultural revolution patterns. One type of account is what I call victim accounts. But fixation on people at either of the polar extremes of pure victim or pure victimizer can be very misleading. Most people weren't in either of those polar extremes. Most people occupied what I would call middle ground as both victim and victimizer. Another issue that comes up is what I would call survival strategies. What are any of us capable of in a situation like that? So, think of the McCarthy period in U.S. history. People were informing on each other left and right. Why? Quite often as a way to survive. So we find this in, I think, all national histories. Another type of interesting account is what I would call marginal voices. I was struck by and attracted to marginalized voices. These voices, for example, force us to think about the Cultural Revolution as a gendered experience. But what about other possible subjects? For example, children. The other issue I want to discuss is the issue of legacies. This issue actually comes up in a lot of the interviews. What sort of impact is the Cultural Revolution still having today on various kinds of people? And of course, this brings up a related question. Why is the Cultural Revolution a research topic that is discouraged by the party state today? The research that, that uh, 
I've done over the past few years based on um, central party documents and published, uh, published works uh, leads me to believe that around 1.6 million people were killed during the period from 66 to 68 and probably around 25 to 30 million people somehow suffered, lost their jobs, were, uh, were um, uh, made the victims of, of a, a false political accusation or were uh, beaten or criticized during a so-called struggle session. Uh, that's 25 million people out of around 750 million. So I'm not trying to minimize the damage, but, but the people who suffered directly were a relatively small percentage uh, of the population. Different regions had different experiences. So if you were in a remote countryside, you had a very different experience than someone who was in one of the major cities, which was really disrupted in the early period. If you were in a province like Guangxi or Inner Mongolia, where there was a lot of killing, uh, and a, a, a lot of killing in a very unusual uh, way, that would be a very different culture revolution. This entire 10-year-long period is, uh, is really quite diverse, uh, and uh, people, part, people of different age groups participated uh, in different ways, and I think they have very different memories. But almost everyone had kind of an everyday experience. Um, sent, being sent down to the countryside, experiencing the rationing of, of food, uh, the problems of shopping, uh, being able to shop and feed your family in the 1970s. Um, that's, that's one kind of uh, everyday life experience that many, many people had. I feel human dignity suffered the most harm during the Cultural Revolution. This phrase, human dignity, seems illusory. What is the meaning of human dignity, after all? 2300 years ago, Mencius gave us a good definition. That is, benevolence, righteousness, propriety, and wisdom. Four key qualities of people. Without this, there's no difference between us and beasts. I feel these within these four qualities. It can be put even more simply. Actually, two are the most important. That is, sympathy, as Mencius said, compassion. Another is the ability to differentiate between right and wrong. If we lose these two qualities, we are no different from animals. I feel the biggest sacrifice in the Cultural Revolution was in humanity dignity. Most of the people we've seen in the interviews were teenagers back then, joining in the Red Guards. We can divide them into two types. One is those who blindly followed whatever the crowd did. The other is those who joined enthusiastically. Of course, there were different degrees of involvement. We probably already know the extent of the cruelty, including even murder, putting people to death. So, although after the 10 years of the Cultural Revolution, all of China began rehabilitation of cases, we must remember that rehabilitation is not the same as reflection. Some people say the Cultural Revolution had some positive effects. I hold a differing opinion. For example, many educated youth went to remote and distant places and may have brought educational opportunities to those who had been unable to get a good education. However, this wasn't the intention of the Cultural Revolution, wasn't its intended outcome. We can use an idiom to describe this. A stroke of luck. It shouldn't be seen as a direct positive effect of the Cultural Revolution. In the history of humankind, there has never been such a large-scale movement of criticism and exposure, and such mass violence. Of course, there have been other examples of mass violence. In the history of revolutions, we can see that all use mass violence. However, the scale of it in China's cultural revolution was unprecedented, and I hope will remain unrepeated. The reason behind fighting for political positions wasn't unusual. But it happened across the nation, among the common people, from city to countryside, with everyone engaging in struggle, not a struggle against a single person, but against a whole generation of people. The struggle was against the best and brightest of an entire generation. Speaking about this, I feel really moved, really filled with sorrow, but I must say this. I hope that China's leaders, no matter which generation, will learn from this experience. 
Mao Zedong wanted to study the first emperor of Qin. He thought, the first emperor of Qin buried 450 Confucian scholars, I have buried 45,000 scholars. But Mao didn't just bury 45,000 scholars. He buried the finest talents in every profession. The levels of education a society needs, which took generations to build up, were destroyed. If there had not been this event, if there had not been the great leap forward, had not been the Cultural Revolution, then China's current prosperity could have developed 40 years earlier. That would have been excellent. Now this is all in the past. It's a pity.